So what we have talked about so far um, is basically just the design of finite impulse response filters or FIR filters. We talked about two different ways for designing FIR filters. One is by just windowing the time domain impulse response of a target or sort of ideal response, right? This kind of thing. But using different kinds of windows, we can achieve different kinds of effects. And then controlling the number of points, we can get different orders for that FR filter. And a second way for designing FR filter is just by optimization. Right? We basically just minimize the difference between the approximate filter and the, the kind of a, uh, target filter. And there are different ways for defining the, the kind of difference. Right? We can minimize either the AO2 norm or the infinite uh, the, the minimax norm right and it's going to result in different kinds of uh, algorithms for for, for 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 generating those uh, FIR filters right um, but FIR filters is pretty much just a generalization of the kind of weighted averaging algorithm that we have started with right so 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 it's pretty much just a generalization of this kind of a formula, right? This kind of formula. So you are you you have the you have the choice of determining the weights, right? You have the choice of choosing the weights. You have the uh, freedom to choose uh, the number of points. But 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 it's pretty much just this kind of a weighted averaging or weighted moving average formula. That's 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 what the FIR filter or any kind of FIR filter. Um, can 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 achieve right, and this kind of weighted averaging, we actually started, we, we actually got this kind of generalized weighted moving average from just a very simple three-point average, right? We started with this kind of three-point equal weight averaging formula. We were sort of saying this is a low-pass filter, and we can actually uh, compute its impulse response, both in the time domain and in the frequency domain, and we determined that it's uh, it's a low-pass filter. Right. And then we basically generalized this particular formula to the to to the weight to the to the to non-equal weight moving average case and with uh, some kind of user-defined uh, number of points. Right. But there's a second level of generalization. So for now, all we are looking at are just uh, are just uh, these kind of non-recursive filters. So on the left hand, on the right hand side, on the right hand side of this averaging formula, you only see the input signal x at different locations, at different time, right? You don't really see any any indication of the y. That's the, our output term. Right? This formula is for computing y n, right? But you can also use pre the the output signal at previous time step suppose n subtract 1 n subtract 2 those those output points to compute the outputs of the current time step so so a second level of generalization makes makes the formula recursive so on the right hand side you have not just the input signal x at different time points but you also have the y output signal at previous time steps Right, and because it's uh, it's previous time steps, so 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 the whole calculation is still causal. You are not really using future output points to compute the current output points. You are using previous output points to compute the current output points. So so you can still make the causal, right? So so let's look at one example. Let's look at one example. A very simplified example, right? And uh, uh, let's. Um, Let's look at this particular example. So yn, that's the output at the nth time step, equals to yn subtract 1 times 0 0.5, that's half of the value of the previous output, the output in the previous time step, plus xn, that's the input signal at the current time step. right? And uh, let's, let's, let's determine what's going to be the transfer function for this kind of a recursive formula. right? Let's let's look at what's going to be the the transfer function, the 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 impulse response uh, 
for this kind of a filter, right? Again, if we do the Fourier transform, small y becomes big y. Independent variable becomes the omega, the frequency. Point 0.5, this is a y and subtract a 1. So it's a shifted y. Right? So the Fourier transform of a shifted y is big y times e to the the amount of shift is minus 1. So it's minus 1 times j omega. Right? And then x is converted into big X. So so if you want to get the transfer function in the frequency domain, all you have to do is to just uh, sort of collect all the terms in, in terms of big Y, containing big Y, and then the terms containing big X, right? So what you actually... So, so... So in terms of the frequency, omega, or if we write write the independent variable as e to the j omega instead of omega, then the transfer function can be just written as big Y divided by big X equals 2, right? 1 divided by 1 subtract 0.5 e to the minus j omega. That's our transfer function for this particular uh, example, right, in terms of the omega. So so let's look at the, what this function actually looks like, right? Let's, let's just... Uh, so O equals to, let's just, uh, minus, that's omega. So from minus pi to pi, right? And then big y, uh, big H equals to uh, 1 dot divide, 1 subtract 0.5 times exp minus 1i times O, right? And then let's just generate a new figure. So plot, let's just plot O divided by pi, that's normalized frequency, ABS big H, right? And then subplot 1, 2, 2, and then plot O divided by pi, uh, unwrap angle big H, right? So, so let's just execute this block. So if we look at the shape of the amplitude in terms of the frequency, or normalized frequency, it's actually a typical low pass filter, right? And with some kind of phase angle in the pass band, right? So, so basically, this this is actually a low pass filter, but it's actually a recursive low pass filter, right? Because it's using not just the input signal itself, but also using the output signal at previous time steps. So it's actually a recursive uh, filter. But it, nevertheless, it's a low-pass filter. Right. So, so now let's let's um, let's uh, let's um, introduce a new variable that's called z. We're going to use z to replace e to the j omega in this formula, right? So y e to the j omega becomes y z. 0.5 e to the minus one j omega becomes what? Becomes z to the minus one's power times big Y, big Y Z, plus big X, big X Z, right? So if we actually use Z, some kind of arbitrary complex number, to replace E to the J omega, we arrive at this particular representation of the input-output relation, right? Again, we can collect the terms containing big Y Z, big Y Z, right? And then we can express the big H the big H, the transfer function in terms of Z, equals to big YZ divided by big XZ, and it equals to 1 divided by 1 subtract 0.5 Z to the minus 1's power. And if we actually use the geometrical series representation, this, this, uh, this, particular, this particular division can actually be represented as a summation. So, so it's a series, so angles from like 0 to infinity, 0.5, z to the minus 1. And then the whole thing takes n's power. Right? And this is actually a uh, geometric series re result. Right? Later on, we're going to see what's, what's the condition for this particular series to converge. Right? It's not like for arbitrary z values, this series is going to converge. It's not like that. If you look at the condition for the geometric series to converge, the stuff that's inside of the parenthesis, 0.5 times z to the minus 1's power, this thing, 
must have a absolute value that's smaller than 1 in order for this series to converge. So, so, so there's conditions on Z, right? This, this particular series is not sort of converging. It's, it's not convergent for any arbitrary value of Z. It's only convergent for a subset of Z values. And if Z actually takes upon the value e to the j omega, in this particular case, in this particular special case, the length of Z, the absolute value of Z, happens to be, to be exactly equal to 1, because the absolute value of e to the j omega equals to 1. The length, the length of this complex number, this complex exponential, actually equals to 1. Right? And for this particular case, when Z has a length that's equals to 1, this formula happens to be identical to this formula. Right. So, so it indicates some kind of relation between Fourier transform and this kind of representation using Z. Right. And we're going to call this particular representation the Z transform of the Z transform of the impulse response of the filter. This is actually the Fourier transform of the impulse response of the filter, right? Suppose you represent the impulse response as small h as a function of n. Then big h e to the j omega is basically the Fourier transform of small h n. And then big h z is what we call the z transform of small h n. And if you're actually using z transform, if we actually sort of go back to the beginning of the lesson 2, several basis sort of basis signals that we have talked about so in, in lesson two right representing any kind of a signal as superpositions of basis signals one of those basis signals was z to the nth power or a to the nth power right a to the nth power some kind of complex explanation right and a could be some kind of complex number here we are just using z to the nth power to actually represent some kind of to, to, to use z to the nth power as some kind of basis signal, right? And what I can tell you is that z to the nth power, this kind of a, uh, complex power, power series, is also an eigenfunction of a linear time invariant system, just like e to the j omega. So one of the consequences for being an eigenvector or eigenfunction of a linear time invariant system is that convolution becomes multiplication in the, in, the, in the transformed domain, right? So for Fourier transform, we now know that the convolution in time domain actually equals 2 is equivalent to multiplication in the frequency domain. The same applies to the z domain, right? Because z to the nth power is also an eigenfunction of a linear time invariant system. So if we actually apply z transform on both the input and on the impulse response, right, then the convolution in time domain is equivalent to multiplication in the z domain also, because z to the nth power is also the eigenfunction of a linear time invariant system. Right. So in this particular case, h big h z equals to so so big y z actually equals to big h z multiplied with big x z. So the output actually equals to the impulse response in the z domain multiply the input in the z domain right and then if you do the multiplication you get the output in the z domain and if you can do a inverse z, z transform you should be able to get the the output signal in the time domain right so now let's look at let's look at the, some sort of more general forms one thing that might be interesting to do is to compare the compare the transfer function for this uh, recursive formula with the transfer function that we have derived for that three-point av moving average formula which is uh, which is which is this thing here right and uh, see what are the differences right let's let's try to find out what are the differences for for this particular formula you have a denominator this denominator is not exactly unity it's a one subtract point five z to the minus one power and you have a numerator that's one. 
right? For for this swing point mo moving average, that's not recursive. On the left hand on the right hand side, it just has a, the input signal x x itself. You don't really have a denominator. So 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 denominator for this particular case is just a one. If you don't count the one over three, this this thing at the beginning as as a, if you just treat this thing as a sort of scaling vector, right? And then this thing as a function of z, right? And then it's not really dividing anything; it's dividing one basically. So it doesn't really have a. Uh, it has a denominator that's just a one, but it has a numerator, right? That's that's a, that's a polynomial of z minus one, z minus one's power, right? So 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 that's one of the differences, right? You have for in this case you have actually um, a denominator in the recursive formula. And then let's let's try to look at the 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 the, the series, right? The series for this recursive formula for this recursive formula, n actually goes from zero to infinity. So it actually has an infinite number of terms that's involved in this summation. But if you look at this particular sum, uh, series summation, uh, uh, summation the representation, it involves finite number of terms. So n goes from minus one to positive one. Right, it's just the uh, three terms basically. Right, it has three terms involved. Right, so you really don't have to worry about the convergence for this kind of non-recursive finite impulse response uh, filter. Right, there's no problem with convergence. It's a it's a finite number of t t terms being summed. For this for this kind of a formula, you have infinite number of terms that's involved in the summation, so you have to worry about the convergence. So if the series is going to converge or not, right? So if it if it converges, then you get this particular formula, right? So this this thing and this thing is equal to each other. If it's not converging, then you cannot really write this equal sign, equal to sign, right? So what's going to be our generalization, right? What's what might be a more general form for this transfer function, right? For this transfer form. For this transfer function, it has a non-unity denominator, but a unity numerator. But for this transfer function, it has a non-unity numerator, but a unity denominator. Right? And for this one, it has an infinite number of terms in the summation. This one has finite number of terms in the summation. Right? So, so a more general form for the transfer function may look like something may look something like that. Big H Z is still expressed as big Y Z divided by big X Z. Right, but but again, but now but now these two these two the big y z and the big x z can now be expressed as summations of z to the minus q's power, z to the minus p's power, each of them with a weight. So 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 in principle, you should in a more general form of the transfer function is a polynomial for z to the minus one in the numerator, and then a polynomial for z to the minus one. In the denominator, right? So, so for for this for this kind of non-recursive filter, what you have rec what you have to sort of you have for this kind of non-recursive filter, you can sort of specify r zero to one, and then r one, r two, r n to be zero, and then you recover a non-recursive discrete filter, right? But if you actually has non-zero values for r1, r2, r n, then essentially you are actually having a non-unity denominator. So it allows you to account for these kind of transfer functions. That's for recursive filters. Right. So the most general form of a transfer function is going to be some some kind of polynomial for z to the minus one. On the denominator uh, numerator and also this, some other kind of polynomial for z to the minus one in the denominator, and then you are dividing them, right? You are dividing these two polynomials. So so now let's try to look at the, those polynomials, right? So if you have studied algebra before, you know that these kind of polynomials can always be organized into this kind of factorized form. For example, the, 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 the numerator can be factored 
into this kind of form. The same is true for the denominator. So, so, so this kind of polynomial actually has roots, right? And for this, for for the denominator, if you actually can, for the for the numerator, if you can actually organize all the all the polynomials into this factorized form, then you can tell what the roots are, right? For example, one of the roots might might be uh, for z minus one might be just a uh, one over q one, right? And then you have one over q two, that kind of thing, one over q m. They have roots, and if one of the roots is actually a complex number, then there must be another root, which is the conjugate of that complex number, right? That's one of the uh, one of the results from uh, algebra. So you can basically just uh, rewrite the numerator and the denominator into this kind of form, factorized form. And then once you can actually write them into this kind of factorized form, the roots for the numerator becomes zeros for big HZ, for the transfer function. So if Z minus 1 actually equals to one of those roots, then big HZ is going uh, to equal to zero. And those roots are now called the zeros of the transfer function. Of course, the denominator also have roots, right? And at those roots, if z minus 1 actually equals to one of those roots, one of those p, p roots, at those roots, the denominator becomes 0. So it's something divided by 0, then you get infinity, right? So, so at those roots of the denominator, the transfer function actually has a value of infinity. And those roots of the denominator are then called the poles of the transfer function. Those zeros and the poles of the transfer function actually are quite important when you actually try to design a filter based on the placement of the poles and the zeros. Later on, we are going to look at how we can actually design filters by placing poles and the zeros at different locations on a complex plane. Right? But, but it's important to understand that the transfer function can be represented in these two different ways, as polynomials in the denominator and the numerator, and as these kind of factorized polynomials. So the, the transfer function can be characterized using those coefficients, for example, beta, beta 0, beta 1, alpha 0, alpha 1. That's one way to characterize the transfer function. And a second way for characterizing a transfer function is by using poles and zeros, basically the roots of the denominators. That's the poles and the roots of the numerators. That's the zeros of the transfer function. So, so now let's let's try to sort of combine the results together, right? So now we're actually looking at we have looked at the FIR finite impulse response, right? But what exactly is the infinite impulse response? So if we actually look at this, go back to look at this kind of recursive formula. If you put the input signal to be a delta delta impulse, right? You set the input signal to be a delta impulse, right? You put put that delta impulse into your filter, then what's going to be the output, right? So for so for for, the, for for y n for n equals to one, for example, y one equals to 0.5 y zero plus x one. So suppose the delta impulse has a non-zero value at x x one, right? And then y y one equals to one, right? And then for y two, it's equals to 0.5 multiply y one, right? Y one equals to one, so it becomes 0.5. Y two becomes 0.5, right? And then it goes on, goes on. You'll see that the impulse response actually is infinitely long, even though the amplitude of the impulse response keeps decreasing by 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 half every for every time. Uh, for every uh, time step, but the but the impulse response is in fact infinite long. It has non-zero values, non-zero amplitudes at all different times. So this kind of recursive formula, this kind of recursive filter, usually results in a infinite impulse response. The reason that 
I say it's usually an infinite impulse response. It's because there are special cases, very special cases, in which case you can you can you can recover a, 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 a you can you can get a recursive formula for a finite impulse response. But those cases are also really studied, really useful. So so we don't really consider those cases to be uh, very useful. So so usually this kind of a recursive formula will give you an infinite impulse response, right? Infinite impulse response. So, so, so for infinite impulse response, you're gonna get this kind of recursive formula. So the output is gonna depend upon not just the a weighted sum of a finite number of points of the input anymore. It, it's also gonna depend upon previous values of y. So here it's a weighted summation of previous values of y and subtract k, and k goes from one to big n subtract one. So, so you have this kind of recursive formula. And for this particular case, for this kind of recursive formula, you can write the you can write the transfer function as this kind of thing. So Hn is the time domain impulse response. And this is sort of the Z transform of that time domain impulse response. Right? You write it, it's just like the Fourier transform, except that you have replaced the e to the j omega. Which has a length of one, with some sort of arbitrary complex number that's called z, which may not have a unity amplitude, right? It could have some sort of arbitrary amplitude or arbitrary length, right? So, 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 so you have this kind of, uh, this kind of, these two kinds of a representation in the z domain, and also in the time domain. In time domain, it's a recursive formula, and in the z domain, it's essentially a z transform of the time domain. Uh, representation, and then for finite impulse response, just for comparison, in the time domain, it's not recursive, so a k equals to zero. For o k, right? You just have this; it's non-recursive. It doesn't involve y. And then in the z domain, the z transform usually involves a finite number of terms. So m goes from zero to big M subtract one, and big M subtract one is actually finite. Right. Involves a finite number of terms. So 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 so. But by using this kind of formula representation of the transfer function, either this one or this one, we can actually account for both cases. Either IRR or FIR. Either cases are fine. Can are, are, can, can be can be represented by by this kind of by this kind of a, a formula. The, the previous two examples are actually computing the both for this example, this uh, non-recursive formula and this recursive formula. We're basically computing the transfer function uh, from this kind of recursive formula in the time domain, right? So, if you are actually given, if you are actually given a transfer function, right, either in the frequency domain or in the z domain, you can compute the time domain recursive formula also, right? So in this case, if you are given a set of poles and zeros for the transfer function, right? What you can do is to the first thing you want to do is to just uh, represent the transfer function using those polynomials. Just expand those uh, factorized expansions into this kind of uh, representations, right? Just convert those poles and zeros into this kind of uh, polynomials. Right, and arrange those terms according to the order of uh, z to the minus one's power. Right, order z to the minus one, z to the minus two, that kind of thing. Right, just 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 rearrange or do some algebra to expand those uh, factorized uh, forms into this kind of form. Right, that's the first thing that you want to do. So so once you have actually done this expansion, you can sort of so so. The transfer function in the z domain, just like in the frequency domain, it's equals to it equals to big Y divided by big X. That's the Fourier domain or z domain representation of the output signal and the input signal, right? And then you can sort of expand. Uh, uh, so 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 big Y can can multiply the, the denominator. The big Y multiplies the denominator should equal to big X multiplies this numerator, right? And then those z to the minus one, z to the minus two, this kind of power, you can you can think of them as e to the j omega, right? 
right? E to the minus j omega, e to the minus two j omega, that kind of thing. And then those 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 convex exponentials are going to be converted into shifts in time domain, right? That's the Fourier shifting formula. That's a Fourier Fourier shifting property, right? And uh, and you can sort of do that both on y and then on x, right? Because big y needs to multiply with one plus a one z to the minus one times big y, right? And then if you convert that into time domain, it becomes a one times uh, small y and subtract one, right? So a one small y and subtract one, right? And then big y times a two z to the minus two converts to time domain becomes what becomes a two, a two small y and subtract two, right? And then you can sort of rearrange all the formulas, rearrange the terms. You you put the y in, that's the y of the current step. Which is resulting from big Y times one. You see, if you multiply big Y with one and then convert it into time domain, it's a small y. Right? There's no shift. And then equals to x n. That's 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 resulting from big X times one. Right? If you convert big X times one into time domain, you get you get a small x n. Right? And then if you if you uh, if you sort of do b one times big X times z to the minus one, convert it into time domain, you get b one. X and subtract one, right? So, so, so either way, you can you can convert the transfer function into a recursive filter, and you can also derive the transfer function from this kind of recursive formula, right? Either recursive or not, right? This one doesn't have a, a y on the right hand side, so this is not a recursive formula, but but you can still get the so so in this kind of representation, in this kind of representation, if you if your numerator is exactly one. Right, and then it's just a one times big X. You don't have X n subtract one, X n subtract two anymore, right? If the denominator is exactly one, so a one a two equals to zero, that kind of thing. And then you don't really have those uh, y n subtract one, y n subtract two, those terms on the right hand side in your recursive formula anymore, right? And the the formula essentially becomes a non-recursive formula, right? So so you can convert it. In either way, right? Either a time domain recursive formula or the transfer function, but either way, actually, either either description actually describes the system uniquely. So, so, so you have this kind of a mechanism to convert back and forth. Before we talk about uh, future design using poles and zeros by by placing poles and zeros, we need to sort of talk a little bit about the so-called Z transform. We mentioned the Z transform. Uh, in several previous slides, for example, in, on the, in this one, we are actually sort of sort of saying that this is the kind of a z transform for y, z transform for x, that kind of thing. But let's now let's try to make it more explicit and uh, talk about what z transform actually is, right? In lesson three, we basically spend the lesson three to talk about discrete Fourier transform, right? And we have this kind of discrete Fourier transform pair, right? So if you have a time domain signal x n. You can compute its uh, discrete Fourier transform by doing this kind of summation, right? Basically, x n multiply e to the minus j omega n, and then doing this summation over all the n, right? And then you end up with a function that's big X. It's a f you, I changed the notation slightly in a previous uh, in the previous lesson I was sort of using big omega as the independent variable, but here I'm writing it as e to the j omega, right? But it's actually the same function, right? I'm just uh, changing the notation a little bit, right? That's sort of the forward Fourier transform, right? So, so now if we actually replace e to the j omega with a letter complex number called z, right? And then we end up with the kind of transform that looks like that kind of thing. So it's still x n, right? X n. But now instead of e to the minus j omega n, e to the j omega is replaced with z. So we end up with z to the minus n, right? And this transform is called z transform, right? So in the special case, that z happens to equal two e to the j omega, then z transform becomes identical to the Fourier transform. So you can think of z transform as a generalization of the Fourier transform, right? A generalization in what sense, right? In what sense? Instead of assuming z is this kind of a unit amplitude complex number, 
for this particular complex number, it's it, the, the the amplitude of it, the length of this complex number in the complex plane is actually unity, right? If you take the absolute value of e to the j omega, it's always unity. It's always a one, right? It's always a one. But but now we're actually generalizing it to what kind of what kind of representatives? You're, you're generalizing it to r times e to the j omega. So if z is actually an arbitrary complex number now, it's no longer this kind of complex number, right? Then then you can always write it. You can always write a a general complex number in this kind of Euler's form, right? It has a length r, and then it has angle omega, right, on the complex plane. So so z equals to r times e to the j omega, and when r equals to 1, when the length of z equals to 1, z transform becomes identical to Fourier transform. Right? So, so you can think of, a, think of a Fourier transform just as a special case for the z transform when the z, when the, when the, when the, when the z parameter is restricted to unit length, to complex numbers that's unit length. So what's actually what's actually the complex numbers with unit length, right? It's uh, in the complex plane, in the complex plane, in the complex plane with horizontal axis that's real axis and then the vertical axis is imaginary axis. The the the, the complex all the complex numbers, the set of all the complex numbers with unit length is actually a circle, right? It's a circle. With the center located exactly at the origin of the complex plane, right? And that circle is called the uni unit circle. So, so, so z transform becomes Fourier transform when z is restricted to that unit circle, right? So that's the kind of a, that's the kind of a relation between Fourier transform and the z transform, and 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 how how you can think of z transform as some kind of generalization of the Fourier transform to to make the z to make the uh, to to make the com complex number z not restricted to unit length complex numbers, so you have you just introduced a a length r, right? And this r, when r actually equals to one, you recover Fourier transform, right? But but in general, r can be a arbitrary number. That's not exactly one. So now let's um, let's let's let's. Uh, Bring z equals to r e to the j omega back into this uh, z transform formula, right? So, so that's the z transform formula, right? So now we have generalized the z from just the e to the j omega on the unit circle itself to some arbitrary complex number. So now you have an r, that's the length of it, and then e to the j omega, right? Omega is the angle of that particular vector, right? But this this vector can now be sort of at any place it's on the complex plane, it doesn't have to be restricted on the unit circle. So now, if if we bring this representation back into the z transform formula, right? Now x z equals to what? X z equals to x n times r to the minus n power, and then e to the minus j omega n. And then we can group those terms together. X n multiply r to the minus n, and then e to the minus j omega n. So, so this transform is actually what? It's actually it's actually the Fourier transform of x n times r to the minus n to power, right? It's actually the Fourier transform of this thing, this thing in the in, in the curly brackets, right? It's the Fourier transform of the stuff that's in the curly brackets. And when r equals to one, that's on the unit circle. You recover you rec recover Fourier transform, but now. But now for z transform r does not have to be one, right? So the the, the range of the summation n equals to minus n to positive n, right? So you have to worry about what's actually the condition for x n r to the minus n. It's for the transform to actually converge, right? So for some of the r, you're going to get convergence, but for some other r, you may not get convergence, right? So we need to sort of study what's actually the region on the complex plane where this formula is actually convergent. And for those regions that's actually convergent, we call those regions the region of convergence, or ROC, region of convergence. Right, right. 
Now let's look at some examples. And uh, uh, by looking at those examples, we can understand the so-called region of convergence better, better, right? Region of convergence. And for this particular example, we're going to look at a causal signal, right? So it's a causal case. So you can think of Xn as maybe just uh, the impulse response of a particular filter in the time domain, right? Or just as some kind of an input signal, but it's a causal input signal, right? The reason that I'm calling it causal is because uh, it has zero amplitudes at all the negative time. So un, un is a unit step function. So you're basically multiplying 0.5 to the nth power with a unit step function. A unit step function has has non-zero amplitudes or unity amplitudes only at time larger than zero, right? So if you multiply this particular function to 0.5 to the nth power, it's going to zero out everything that's before time zero, right? So negative time is going to have uh, zero amplitudes. So 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 xn is a causal signal, right? And then let's try to compute its um, its z transform, right? So we we, are, we bring this representation back into the z transform formula. It's xn times z to the minus nth power, and then sum over all the n, right? And because because un only goes from is non-zero only from uh, uh, zero to infinity, so so we can change the range of the summation from minus infinity to positive infinity to zero to positive infinity, and then we can replace the xn with 0.5 to the nth power. Right, un is the unit step function, right? So it has a unity amplitude for this particular range, and goes from zero to positive infinity, right? And then we do the uh, we do our calculations. That's uh, that's a 0.5 to the nth power, z to the minus the nth power, combine them together, we get 0.5 divided by z, right, and then to the nth power, the whole thing to the nth power, right. So for this particular summation to converge, for this particular summation to converge, it's an infinite series, right. If, if you want a finite result for this particular summation, then 0.5 divided by z has to be smaller than 1, right. So, so so that's the one of the results for the geometric series, right? This thing has to be smaller than one for the whole summation to be convergent, for the series to be convergent. And then the condition for 0.5 divided by z is smaller than one is equivalent to z larger than 0.5, right? And the region of convergence is exactly the region for for this particular summation to to uh, to have a convergent result, right? And that's that's z larger than 0.5. So this is the complex plane. The horizontal axis is the real axis, and the vertical axis is the imaginary axis, right? And uh, well, the region for z larger than 0.5 is what? So so this is the unit circle, right? This is the unit circle. And then this is a this circle represents all the complex numbers with its uh, length equals to 0.5. So z must have a length that's larger than 0.5 for this particular series to converge, right? And the region for that is all the blue regions, all the blue regions, right? And 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 for this particular, uh, if if this series actually converges, then you have this uh, geometric series representation. It's a one subtract 0.5 z minus one, right? And uh, the, the numerator is just a one, so it doesn't have any kind of a. Uh, but 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 denominator. The denominator actually has a pool, right? It has a root, has a root. So so. So the pool is located at z minus one equals to two. Right. So if you want the denominator uh, want the denominator to be zero, then z minus one has to be equals to two, right? Which equals which uh, which is uh, z equals to point five. Right, z minus one equals to two, so z equals to point five. Right, so z equals to point five. That's 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 this location. That's the pole. Right, this red circle. That's point five. And uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, this example is actually quite a quite typical example. It's a canonical example. So basically, for causal signals, you you are going to have a region of convergence that's kind of a uh, containing the infinity. Right. So it's actually outside of a circle.
outside of the certain, certain circle, right? So a region of convergence. For causal signal, the region of convergence on the complex plane is kind of outward, right? Outward of outside of the circle, basically. And the, the radius of the circle is is determined by the, 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 the pole. In fact, uh, for this particular example, you, you have just the one pole. But if you have multiple poles, then the region of convergence is going to be bounded by the by the pole with the largest radius, right? Suppose you have a pole here, right? And then then the region of convergence is going to be outside of the pole, the, the circle that kind of goes through that largest pole, the the pole with the largest uh, uh, length. I mean, right? So 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 that's a that's a causal example, right? And uh, it's causal, and it also can the region of convergence also contains the unit circle, right? Later on, we're going to look at this particular property. If the region of convergence actually contains this unit circle, it means that this particular system is stable. So if you think of Xn as a transfer function or the impulse response of some kind of filter, then Stability actually means what? It means that if your input signal is bounded, it doesn't have a ridiculously large amplitude in the input signal, then the output signal is also bounded, which means a bounded input, bounded output, which, calls, which is called stability. Right? Usually you want a stable viewer. Right? So, so, so the region of convergence, if the region of convergence contains the unit circle, then your your, your filter or your system, linear time invariant system, is going to be stable. It's going to be a stable system, bounded input, bounded output, right? That's a, that's a one example of a causal and a stable system, right? It's a causal and a stable system. That's that's the kind of system that we would like to have for our filters or other linear time invariant systems. Now let's look at the, the region of convergence for an anti-causal system. The, the, the function xn looks very similar to this particular function, but but now the the unit step function is a minus n is a u minus n subtract one. So it's going to have unity amplitude in all the negative time, and it has exactly zero amplitudes for all the positive time. So the series is going to look look something like that. It's minus 0.5, minus 3, minus 0.5, minus 2, that kind of thing. And then at all the positive time, it's going to switch to zero. And for this kind of signal, it's called anti-causal signal. It's non-causal. It's anti-causal, basically. Right? Because all the non-zero amplitudes are located at the negative time. And then positive, positive time is all zero amplitudes. Right? So, 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 what's going to be the z-transform for this particular sequence, right? So, n goes from minus infinity to positive infinity x n, and then z to the minus n's power, right? And then this time, let's uh, let's switch the re regions now, because uh, because uh, it's anti-causal. So, all the non-zero amplitudes are in the negative time, so in the negative n. So, so n has to go from minus infinity to minus one, and then 0.5 to the n's power. You have minus one. You have this minus sign in front of the summation, and then z to the minus n's power. Right now, now let's let's sort of do some manipulations. So it's n to the minus. So so basically, you can just do z divided by 0.5, and then to the minus n's power. Right now, at this stage, we can replace minus n with m, for example, m. We can replace minus n with m. Right, so it becomes z to the divided by 0.5 to the m's power. And then m is going to have a positive range. m is going to go from 1 to positive infinity, right? Because m equals to minus n, right? And then the minus sign in front of it. So what's going to be the condition for this particular geometric series to converge, right? Again, z divided by 0.5 has to be smaller than 1, which means what? Which means z must be smaller than 0.5. The length of z must be smaller than 0.5. Right. So, so, so for this particular geometric series, the region of convergence is inside of this unit, uh, u inside of this circle. So this is the unit circle now here, right? That's the unit circle. That's the unit circle here, right? And then that's the circle with a radius of 0.5. So the region of convergence is for z to be smaller than 
0.5. The length of these is smaller than 0.5. So the region of convergence is the blue region now. Right. And if if it actually converges, if it actually converges, then again you can use the results from the geometric series and do some algebraic manipulations. And you end up with this particular formula. Right. Again, again, you can sort of look at the poles of this particular formula. Right. So z to the minus one has to equal to two for the for the for the denominator to be zero. Right. And then and then z has to be equal to 0.5. So 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 the pole is again located at this location. But now, but now the the region of convergence is actually a circle that's sort of passing through the pole, and then but it's inside that circle instead of the outside of the circle, right? If you compare it with this one, it's just the opposite, right? It's just the opposite. For for the region of, for this particular case, the region of convergence is all the blue regions here, and the white region is like a exactly the blue region in for this particular case, and the pole is here. Right, the pole is bound. Actually, the, the the boundary of the region of convergence actually goes through this pole. Right, but for this particular case, the unit circle, this circle, this dash line, the unit circle is not contained in the region of convergence. It's actually outside of the region of convergence for this particular example. And the, later on, we're going to look at the the implications of it. Right, it means actually this particular signal is, if you think of it as the transfer from, or the impulse response of a filter or the impulse response of a linear time invariant system, then this system is not going to be stable. It's unstable. It's unstable. It's not bounded input, bounded output anymore. So it's it's a it's an unstable system, right? Now let's look at the stability of the system, right? Uh, stability means what? Means bounded input, bounded output. So if you send a system a input that's bounded, then the output must also be bounded for the system to be stable, or BIBO, right? Or BIBO, bounded input, bounded output. So, what does it mean for for bounded, right? So, so here is a signal y at the function of n time points. For for system to be for for signal to be bounded, if you take the absolute value, if you take an absolute value. For for any n for any n belongs to the integer. For, if you take the absolute value, it's smaller than some kind of a maximum number. So it's not infinity, right? It's not infinity. Then this signal is called bounded, right? So in order for a, for a system to generate bounded output for any kind of bounded input, the the the, the impulse response small h n has to be what we call the absolutely summable. So if you take the absolute value of h at every point, and then do this summation over over all the points, right? And this summation has to be smaller than infinity, right? It's not it's not uh, it's not it's not like a like a input or output signal that's bounded, right? It's a you have to you have to make sure that the, the impulse response. The reason that you have to consider this kind of summation is because the output is basically the Impulse response convolved with the input, and that convolution has a summation in it, right? So if your input is bounded, the summation of the of the absolute values of uh, impulse response has to be bounded. It has to be smaller than infinity, right? So 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 now let's look at uh, now let's look at uh, the uh, what 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 this particular equation actually implies, right? So the summation of the absolute values of the impulse response equals to uh, what? The summation of the absolute value of the impulse response at every point multiply the absolute value of e to the minus j omega n. Right? Because because the length of e to the minus j omega n exactly equals to one. Basically here you are just replacing h n absolute value multiply one with h m absolute value multiply this absolute value, right? And this multiplication equals to what? You can actually combine combine these these two terms into the absolute value evaluation, right? So this this evaluation equals to the absolute value of h n times one multiply e to the minus j omega n, right? And if you replace one with r, 
it's r into the j omega right and then minus n basically you are actually sort of um, sort of um, so the replacing one times e to the minus j omega n with this r times e to the j omega n, and then the formula becomes sort of if you replace r times e to the j omega with z, you'll see that it's actually the evaluation of the z transform with the absolute value on each of the point, right? So 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 the condition for the boundedness of the for for the for the for the absolutely summable condition. For the impulse response is actually equivalent to the z transform on the unit circle, right? It's actually equivalent to the z transform of the on the unit circle to be convergent, right? If it's divergent, if it's not convergent, then you don't have this condition, smaller than infinity, right? So if you want if you want the impulse response to be absolutely summable, it's it's the same as requiring as requiring the z transform on the unit circle to be convergent. So it means what? It means that for 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 a system to be stable, satisfying this sort of absolutely summable condition, the unit circle has to be in the region of convergence or ROC. And and that actually gives you the bounded input, bounded output, right? So, so based on these three examples that we have looked at so far, what can we say? What can we say about uh, the relation between poles and zeros and behavior of the system, right? We can actually say quite a lot. We can say quite a lot. So, if you need stability, then ROC must contain the unit circle. And uh, that's sort of the mathematical proof of why. Why? Because the boundedness, the, the, the absolutely dissumable condition, for the impulse response is equivalent for to 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 the to the convergence condition on the unit circle of the z transform right so so the unit the unit circle must be in the region of convergence for the system to be uh, stable right you have have bounded input or bounded output bibo right and if you need a cold law system then the region of convergence must con contain infinity and the transfer function will be a right-sided sequence. And the example is is this example. So if you want this, if you want if you want your system to be causal, right, it has zero amplitude at negative time, at all negative time, right? If we want it to be causal, then 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 the region of convergence must look like uh, this kind of thing, right? So so. So infinity is also inside of the uh, region of convergence, basically, right? And if you need an anti-causal system, then the region of convergence must contain the origin. That's the canonical example of an anti-causal system, right? It has zero amplitude on all the positive time, on all the positive time. Right. And non-zero amplitude at negative time, so it's a it's a right it's a left-sided system. It's a left left-sided uh, uh, transfer function or uh, impulse response, right? And uh, its uh, its corresponding region of convergence is going to look like that. So the point zero is going to be inside of the region of convergence, right? And uh, if you need both stability and causality. If you need both stability and causality, then all the poles of the transfer function must be strictly inside the unit circle. So what does it mean, right? What does it mean? So so again, let's look, go back to look at this particular example. This example is causal, right? It's a causal, it's a causal signal. It's a causal, causal transfer function, right? And then the unit circle is inside of the region of convergence, right? So 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 so. Which which means what? Which means that it's both causal and uh, stable. And then let's look at the what where the pole actually is. The pole is at at this location. It's strictly inside the unit circle, right? So so having all the poles strictly inside of the unit circle means what? First of all, it means that it means that the 
the region of convergence cannot contain the poles, right? The major region of the convergence cannot contain the po or the or the or the poles because at the at those poles, at those locations of the poles, uh, it's a it's a the z transform is actually infinity, so it's not really converging, right? Because the denominator, the pole at those locations, the pole of the transfer function is actually a zero. Uh, the the, the, the de denominator of the transfer function is actually zero, right? So, 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 so the transfer function is actually has a value of infinity. So it cannot be, it can. So all the poles cannot be in the inside the region of convergence. So if all your poles are in strictly inside of the unit circle, then the region of convergence must be outside of the all the poles. Right outside of all the sort of the circle that contains all the poles, uh, the smallest circle that contains all the poles, basically, right? And because because all the poles are strictly smaller than one, has a length smaller than one, so 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 the unit circle must be strict, must be inside, must be inside the region of convergence, right? So so by saying that by saying that uh, by saying that the uh, all the poles of the transfer function is strictly inside the unit circle. What you're actually implying is that the region of convergence is uh, sort of like uh, the, this kind of thing, right? It contains the infinity. The region of convergence contains infinity, and the unit circle is contained inside the region of convergence. So in this case, you have both stability and causality. 